I watch this. Sorry, watch not my favorite feature in Zoom, but. 6.30, so let's call this meeting to order of the Public Works Committee. We have a quorum so we can do business, the first item of which are the minutes of September 13th, 2021. This is Robert Burke. I would make a motion to approve the minutes of 913. We have a motion. Do we have a second for Robert's motion? This is Susan. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion with respect to the minutes? Hearing none, those in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the minutes are adopted. And I'll abstain because I didn't, I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. So maybe that, okay. Okay. That's on Sean, you can record Kerry as an abstention. You bet. All right, then we're gonna skip item number two on the agenda for the time being and move on to item number three. First. Pleasant Road, Pleasant View Road Reconstruction Transportation Project Plat. 15-106. Exactly. And we did one of these not so long ago uh, where we had to amend a plat, but um, there's another one now that came in mostly because um, the um, state offered to rebuild part of Highway 14 near Pleasant View um, using federal and state funds. So the city funds won't even be involved in it, but there's more extensive grading because of it. And so it needs um, more temporary limited easement uh, set aside. So we have to go through this process to amend the plan again. And, and I recommend a recommendation to the council to do that. Seems to be pretty straightforward. I'll recommend that we approve it, Don, to, uh, to council, I should say, Don. Okay. All right, we have a motion to recommend uh, approval of the amendment to the Common Council. Is there a second to Don's motion? This is Carrie. I will second the motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and that will be our recommendation to the Council. Agenda item number four, prime urban property, 6230 University Avenue TIA analysis, or TI traffic and that impact analysis approval. Right, so this is for a proposed redevelopment of where um, Mikochina restaurant was and the, uh, the laundromat I think was in there. Um, and, and our consultant took a look at it as they do for all these rezonings and um, didn't recommend any changes attributable to the proposed development. So it's a pretty straightforward report and staff is recommending approval of the TIA. All right, again, this one seems fairly straightforward also. Any discussion committee? Questions? No. Would someone like to offer a motion? Sure, this is Robert. I would make a motion to recommend approval of the uh, traffic impact analysis of, uh, approval to the common council, I guess. Uh, this will just be at the committee level, we'll deal with Oh, well then, heck, this is easy. I, 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 I make a motion to approve it. All right. All right, we have a motion to approve the traffic impact analysis report. Is there a second to Robert's motion? It's an easy one, folks. This is Carl, I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion with respect to the motion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And uh, we have approved the TIA report. All right. Item number five. Yeah, so next up is a, a request that the um, 
city enter into an agreement to both create an easement for our storm sewer line, part of which was in the county's right of way at the corner of Century and Branch, and then uh, immediately also create uh, approval of some encroachments into that easement area. And it might be helpful if I get us to a, a, a diagram. Instead of all of these words. Okay, so you can see this really, in fact, let me zoom in on it just a bit. You can see this sort of thin line is mostly out in the right of way. And then there used to be a big corner clip here uh, that was also county right of way. Um, and so a 10 foot offset line from our existing storm encumbers part of what is now private property for the uh, apartment development. And, and some of the request is that we allow certain things from the plan. I'm again, just scrolling toward a picture here. Um, to allow a couple little corners of the building to encroach into that easement area, a corner of the stairway and associated rail, some of the patio and a couple of um, features associated with the patio that would go into at least in part the easement area, but none of which would really, I think, materially affect our ability to operate, repair, replace the storm sewer line. So uh, our city attorney uh, has vetted this agreement already, so we're in good shape there. The one change that's still coming from a discussion last Friday uh, is that the developer uh, is looking into raising the uh, building by a couple of feet. So where it says that the lower level is at 871 and a half, that might be 873 or 873 and a half uh, in the very near future, which is then starting to get closer to being even with the invert elevation of our existing pipe. But it's, you know, a little more than seven feet from the center of the pipe to the edge of the wall. So level isn't really a fair comparison. When it comes down to future excavation, we usually assume a one-to-one -one slope. So if we had to dig to replace this, this heavy dashed line is normally what I'm looking at, um, which would get us up into the foundation basically as one of our trench walls. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Even if this elevation goes up by a couple of feet, we're still going to be uh, covered in terms of future excavation, if that makes sense. Um, so while this, these Exhibit B drawings are now, as of last Friday, long, um, <laughs> making them right, I think, is still going to be OK. So I, I would recommend that the committee recommend this to the Common Council contingent upon uh, staff approval of final plan drawings so that we can refer to them in the agreement itself. I just left it highlighted right now as to what the date of those final plans is. Uh, let me zoom back out because half a paragraph doesn't Come make on. a lot of sense. Could you explain to me, since I'm a non-engineer, why having the building not as low or changing the elevation of the building is not a problem? It's actually better in this case. Right now, one of our concerns with the uh, basement elevation at 871 is that the site grading gets into what we've mapped as a modeled um, floodplain. We think the water of the creek just west of this building yeah. uh, in a flood situation can get as high as 878, which would mean that water can get up to the top of bank onto the site and go into their basement. Okay. Picking the site up by a couple feet helps. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to do really with you being able to get to the storm sewer. No, no, that's just fallout from a different decision, which on balance is a much better decision. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, I have a question. If you're done, Susan, are you? Yes, I'm through. Okay. Um, why, why was this building 
not designed within the constraints of the easement. Like I'm kind of confused, like why there's even this encroachment problem to begin with, because it seems like there's an easement there and that they should design it not to encroach it to begin with. Yeah, and I don't have a satisfactory answer for that. That was one of the early engineering staff review comments as well is, you know, we know that we're gonna need this easement. It hadn't been drawn yet, but we knew it would be 10 feet from the existing storm line and let's try to keep the building out of that um, right. instead of almost out of that. Um, so like I say, I, I don't have a satisfactory answer. I know once we get down to this side, it's pretty tight to the driveway, which is pretty tight to the property line. So a couple of feet matters, but could it have been squeezed over by a couple of feet? I think maybe it could have been. Um, so the driveway's further up on Branch Street? Uh, yeah, the driveway is as far away from Century Avenue as they could make it. Okay, that's yep. good. Yeah. That's real good. Yeah, there are some good things with this site plan. Um, and there's oh, no driveway on Century either. There is not, no. Okay, that's an improvement. Yes. Um, I guess the point is perhaps the building could have been uh, designed and the patio could have been designed just a little bit smaller to fit within the... Uh, yeah. That's, that's what I'm thinking, because I, I just, I, I guess I hesitate to give exceptions, just like, let's just throw them out here and there for not really a really an important reason, um, other than they didn't design it within the constraints that we set. So I, I guess I'm just hesitant to like establish that precedent, so like, okay, now the next developer that comes may look at this and be like, oh, we can build our building a little bit bigger because they'll just, you know, they'll just give us some more space. It's not a big deal. Yeah, and there's never any guarantee. It comes down to site by site analysis. Um, you know, some things we've just said can't be done. There are some things it, it's in my preference, it's in my recommendations not to do. But I think there are competing interests um, too. You know, and and I never can get into things like, you know, within the building itself, can it be made two feet shorter? I don't know. Uh, you know if if each unit can shrink by three inches, um, I can't say. Uh, so I'm sure so the developer I look at these things no too way. and say, oh, sorry, Don, what? Yeah, I'm sure the developer would say, hey, these are units, you're affecting, uh, I'm not sure, it's three-story structure? Uh, or four, maybe, I think. Four-story, so you're affecting four units. Mm -hmm. uh, Piano is not an issue as far as I'm concerned because, you know, it, we destroy the patio. Well, sorry, you built it there. Yeah. Yeah. How many feet is it actually extending into the easement? The corners. Um, it doesn't look like a whole lot. It, it, it's in the ballpark of a couple feet, two feet, four inches. I would think they could do this, do something about it. So it's, it's patio, and what is the area to the left there? Um, let me just... Uh, stormwater. So this is a patio, and yeah, this is a little stormwater pond mm -hmm. over here. So this so, is sorry, just a patio, grading, what are the other just a grading areas? line, no big okay. deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, right there, though, what are the other areas that are overextending the easement? Um, so this is a little bit of a stairway with a railing that comes from an exterior door and leads to a sidewalk that goes out to the path along Century. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. got a corner in it. And then these are just building corners. Doesn't seem like that would have been so hard to miss in the initial design. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I, I am not sure. I recommended that they move it. I'm sure they had some reason for not doing that. I, it's one of those things I don't push too hard. I say, well, can we make it work? I think we can make it work. There's no guarantee the city's going to agree with that. Uh, 
Well, committee, what's your pleasure? This is Robert. I guess I would say, while I, I mean, I think pushing back a little is not a bad thing in general. I, I feel like this is almost like just like the brickwork or whatever on the outside of a building. They like probably had it a certain distance away. And then when you start building walls, certain, you, you know, you, you creep over a little bit. As an engineer, I, I feel like I've, you know, things drift a little bit from your original intent. And then you're like, well, is this, is this really objectionable? And, and we've already heard uh, from Sean that these little corners, that's all they really are, is just little jutting out corners of, of parts of the building go in briefly into this area. I'm not particularly concerned about it, but I also understand the idea of holding the line. I, I, but I personally am not too worried about this slight intrusion past a dashed line that is, you know, the dashed line is about eight feet away and it looks like the corners of the buildings might be six foot five away from the center line of that, that, that storm sewer or that sewer system. Yeah, our easement is 10 feet to this dashed line, I'll say it. Well, 10 feet then, there. And so they measured over, you know, it's seven, nine at one corner and seven, okay. eight at the That's other corner. That's where the seven, nine is. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So then it's, like you said, about two feet in. I, Sean, I have one more question and it's a little irrelevant. I had a constituent complain about this development because it was going to be too congesting it would cause too much congestion on an already busy intersection. Would moving, getting rid of those two corners help any in terms of the vision triangle or is it even needed since it's a stoplight? Yeah, I was gonna say it's a traffic signal control here. So our, our visibility needs are pretty limited. Yeah, that's what I was thinking and getting way of rid of those driveways is a big improvement, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So to get this moving along, I'll move that we uh, recommend approval to city council. Don? Okay, is... Carl, I'll second it. Okay. A motion and a second to um, approve the uh, easement encroachment in effect. To recommend with... to the council what they do. Is that with, with the, the contingency? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Gary. I yeah, no, I was sometimes. asking the same thing. It's with staff, the contingencies that are written in the memo, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this would be waiting on final plans and then also adjusting exhibit B drawings to reflect the new uh, building height. Okay. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. Uh, the ayes have it with carry recorded as a no, I believe. That correct. And the motion carries. That's that's what I got too. I'm, am, and I heard that correct, Carrie. You voted yeah. nay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. We can't always agree on everything all the time. No, heck no. Really fun with that. Happen. Probably a good thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, item number six on the agenda, Middleton Beach Road, easement agreement. Yeah, this is, well, we run into this on Middleton Beach Road. We don't have a formal easement. Again, I'm just going to skip to the drawing part of this, but the main residence is on the lakeside. Middleton Beach Road is on the left side of your screen and they're rebuilding a garage. Um, the garage structure itself is clear of the um, 20 foot wide sanitary sewer easement. Uh, so the, this kind of runs through most of the backyards on Middleton Beach Road between the houses and garages. Um, and, and we have a 20 foot wide prescriptive easement. We have an interest in this land to keep it functional for the community. Um, 
but every now and then that works out not to be a great thing. So uh, the request here is for an eave, three feet wide, nine inches above grade, part of which would encroach into the sewer easement in this grayish triangular shaped wedge if that's coming through on your screens. Um, so this whole thing is three feet wide. That's about half of it, uh, the way I'm looking at it. And what this looks at from a side view would be, you know, here's the back garage wall and this eave would hang out and be a little bit of a rain shield for stuff that they want to put under uh, the outside wall of the garage under this overhang. So it's nine um, feet above the grade. I thought you said nine inches. I'm sorry, nine feet above nine grade. Feet above yep. Grade. Okay. And it'll stick out from the wall by three feet. Okay. So this so is a really low concern for me. And, you know, in terms of if we have to get a backhoe in there to repair a sanitary line, this extra little foot and a half corner is of pretty low concern to me. Okay. I would make a motion to, are we rec yeah, recommending uh, uh, approval of this resolution 2021 49 to the Common Council. And I'll suggest Susan, a I'll contingency. Second. Oh, thanks, Susan. I'll suggest a contingency to uh, uh, approval of city attorney with the final form. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That'd be great. That is part of my motion. All right. We have a motion and we have a second. Is there discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Uh, the ayes have it, and that will be our recommendation to the council. All right, I think that brings us back to uh, Bell Farm. And I think we probably ought to go ahead with this. And other people can join us in progress if they get here. Is that reasonable? Uh, I did see that Kathleen is in now and Bruce yes. is too. Oh, Correct. Okay. Everyone's here. Yes. All right. So we delayed just long enough. We, we really appreciate you doing that as well. Thank you all for making that switch. Not a problem. Uh, yeah, easy. Um, all right, Sean, do you want to kick this off with a little bit of an overview or how do you want to proceed here? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you've uh, had time to read the memo that Bruce had prepared in terms of what the policy questions for the committee uh, are being asked about. And it, it largely comes down to, number one, this is a revised concept based on past input from Public Works Committee, but also other committees. Um, and there's recognition that Bellefontaine has just been left as a two-lane neighborhood street, but acknowledgement that MPO staff, CARPC staff are still looking into uh, future traffic projections for that. So I read this to be, you know, that that's still up in the air. We still have the entire city's master plan issue to deal with. Um, so I just want to put Bellefontaine Boulevard off to the side for right now. I do still have some concerns with it, regardless of number of lanes. Um, but until we have some guidance from MPO staff um, in terms of traffic projections, I don't know that we can really talk about it in a sort of comprehensive way. Sean, tell me exactly what MPO staff will do. They just do projected traffic counts and forecasts and things of that nature. Is that correct? Yeah, so they're, they're working with the Capital Area Regional Plan Commission staff okay. and City of Middleton planning staff to okay. put together a traffic model to forecast long-term uh, regional traffic needs. And, and they're zeroing in on this area at our request just to make sure that we understand what their model is looking like for the future of this part of Dane County, if that makes sense. But the final design of 
the, the streets in the city of Middleton is not subject to their review or their approval. That is subject to the, the city's planning and, and modeling, correct? Yeah, we all want to work together uh, yeah, to, yeah. to the degree that we can work together. Um, but right, MPO is not in a position to come tell the city of Middleton, you have to build this regional facility, right? They can tell us what the overall needs are, and we need to start making decisions about how are we going to uh, account for traffic that is going to come from someplace and go to someplace else through Middleton, right? So if we don't build something that meshes with the regional traffic models, um, traffic will find a way. If it goes on, um, you know, Briarcliff or County K or Century Avenue um, or Graber Road or anything else that we do end up planning, designing, building, um, certain streets that we don't want traffic on are gonna get traffic. This isn't a, if you don't build it, they won't come kind of thing. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so we ask them for that because they have big picture uh, expertise in exactly this sort of thing. Sean, so, may I add something? Yes. I was at the TIF meeting this afternoon and this was discussed and Mark Opitz and Mike Davis both made it pretty clear the city's leaning towards keeping Bellefontaine just two lane and using the rest as stormwater and bike uh, ped trails. And, and I think that was a good um, planning compromise at the time to design it as a four lane facility with the regional <laughs> traffic modeling we had at that time. I think it's a good uh, leaning now to reinvestigate that because there's been a change just east of here at the county's purchase of what used to be the acre farm, which was part of our growth um, area. Right. Um, but un until we have some sort of confirmation, I'd be really hesitant to reach a conclusion. Well, that's why I was asking questions about it at the TIF meeting. Yeah. But they, may, I, may I, since you mentioned me, can I just oh, clarify something? Yes. Hey, this is Mark here's, Opitz, here's Mark city Opitz planner. Right yeah. Um, so what we said was we recognize that thinking about four lane roads is evolving and that we try to not have arterial streets in neighborhoods, but we recognize that the width, the right of way width is still appropriate. And we want to see what the outcome of the MPO modeling is. So I wanted to make sure that you didn't, I mean, the way I heard Alder West say it is that we were, in support of a two-way, two-lane road, but that's only if the modeling supports it. I want to make it clear that that's that that was our view, yeah. and that that we still support the wider right-of-way because there are other things that can be done in that corridor, like a linear greenway with a bike regional bike path, which we are, uh, which we've envisioned along this corridor as well. So I just wanted to clarify, just to make make it clear what our position is. Yeah, you made it clear. Okay, thank you. Do you have any idea what the timing might be of MPO's modeling? I mean, are we looking at weeks, months, years? I thought, I thought that they were gearing toward end of September, but I haven't heard an update lately because we're at the end of September. Yes, we are. So that I don't know. I heard the same thing that it, it could just be days, but you never know if something happens you might not hear about and, and then find out it's been delayed two months. But my understanding is it might just be days away from getting us some information, which then I don't know how quickly we can determine what that information means to us either. You know, interpretation of data sometimes takes some time as well. Um, yeah. But I think this could be happening fairly quickly. So, if, and, and because it pertains to this development on Parmenter Street, the council made a decision, well, let's have a 90 foot wide right of way. Let's build a two lane road with a median. And if at some point we need additional lane capacity, we'll take the median out and put additional lanes in. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I could foresee something like that too, as opposed to uh, designing a, a very wide right of way with um, a future median and four lanes. Um, that might be a different way to reach a compromise for future projections that may or may not pan out. Um, you know, but but we're just not there yet with the information to really start that dialogue on what should the planning be, what should the design be of Bellefontaine. And personally, I find it kind of difficult to talk about the design of the other street too when you don't know what the design of the main one is going to be. It, it's always a little difficult for me too to parse these things out and talk about them one at a time because we're talking about a network and, and I can appreciate that we want to get as many answers as we can right now. I, I don't know best how to do that when, let me get to uh, the newest uh, diagram that we have here. So this is a really good diagram. Um, let me move our window down just a bit. Um, in an overview, so there's Bellefontaine and we're just putting a pin in that for right now. Um, until MPO and CARPC can advise the city on what the, the newest long-term uh, projection of that is. Parmenter Street, we've already got a decision from the council in terms of how to build that. Um, I'm gonna mispronounce this, but Sarah Bean, something like that. Serenby. Serenby. All right, and I'll mispronounce it next time too, but. <laughs> um, it would be sort of this north-south um, street that would go out to Par Manor, cross Bellefontaine, and terminate at the south uh, Platte line, basically. It'd connect to what looks like a private drive, but that's not a public drive then, um, the way it's drawn. And, and this is proposed um, in this cross-section. Let me zoom in on this for us. Can folks see that okay? Yes. Okay. So it's a bit of a hybrid um, for, you know, one city standard that has a 28 foot wide street, but to put it within a 50 foot right of way. And the trade off there is um, this is labeled as, you know, 12 feet and eight feet. Although realistically, if we're calling that 20 feet for driving and none of it for parking, it's not really 20 feet, it's 19 feet because we don't allow driving in the gutter. Um, we, we wouldn't want that. Um, so we're talking about two nine foot lanes plus an eight foot parking lane, if that's the intent. Um, plus four and a half foot wide grass terraces with five foot sidewalks. So there's parking on one side. Uh, there are fairly narrow driving lanes. There are very narrow terraces. Um, and, and in the overall context, let me zoom back out now, we've got, for the most part, multifamily uh, development. We've got some single family, I think single family development, some retail slash um, commercial sort of development, and then a large park up here. That's what this road is serving. So um, part of my staff comments were, I think it might make more sense to look at this as something of a neighborhood collector instead of just a purely um, minor residential street serving literally low density housing. Um, you know, so the city's gonna have to think about whether they want parking on both sides of this road, whether they want bike lanes on this road to connect to the park um, and points east, you know, so, so that I guess, you know, part, part of what I don't know is, you know, are folks from up and down this road going to want to bike up to this park? And if so, are they going to feel comfortable doing it in something that has uh, a fairly narrow cross section for usable pavement and really narrow terraces. Um, I don't know, 
but I, I have some reservation about that. Sean, what's the, what's the standard on um, low density residential streets for the width of driving lanes? Um, we have a couple <laughs> in our standards. Let me uh, go up to, I copied out into my memo, the current city standard sections. So for low density, low volume streets, the options really boil down to having a shared 12 foot wide travel area. And the real option is whether you have parking on one side or parking on both sides. Um, with the intention of having a fairly narrow or normal <laughs> terrace area and a normal sidewalk area so that we could plant trees and have some separation between vehicles and people. One of those fits within 50 feet of right of way and one fits within 60 feet of right of way. Uh, and when we say low volume, one is appropriate, we think for less than 500 vehicles per day and the other one goes up to as much as a thousand vehicles per day. Sean, to help me, would Glacier Ridge or John Muir and Middleton Hills be equivalent They've got parking on one side, two lane, eight foot terraces, five foot sidewalk, but I don't know the width of the street. Yeah, it, it probably would fall more into this category where it's pretty low density. It's very light traffic. People don't yeah. drive there unless they live there. Um, you know, I, some of this got built into um, um, the local street network in um, Misty Valley, just east of here. Okay. In, in um, I think Peak View Way is one of these streets. Don, can I jump in for a sec here? Yeah, that'd be great. So um, like you mentioned, uh, it is kind of a hybrid between this 50 it, this, it's a 60 foot right of way street width of 28 feet that provides the 500 to 1,000 vehicles per day within the 50 foot right of way. Um, and so, I mean, ideally we would, we would prefer the, just the standard 50 foot right of way. Um, but um, I mean, that would be our, that would ideally, we would we would love to have that street primarily because it, if you look at the street itself and the adjacent uses, um, there are a number of single family you know shotgun homes and any of the any of the single family uh, homes that that front the street um, are have all all the parking is accessed through the back, so there aren't any there are no driveways onto the street itself, so it's strictly mm -hmm. for or um, there's, you know, there's no in and out turning movements um, as aside from the private private connections. Right, so I mean, you have yeah. these sort of shared use driveways. Right. It, I guess right. that's gonna create some skin friction, but not as much as, you know, a dozen yeah. driveways, that's true. Yeah, and so I, my, you know, when I came up with the cross section, the 28 feet, I was like, okay, that seems to be a workable, you know, you get a little extra pavement width to allow for that two-way. If you have parking on one side, you got to you allow, um, you know, well, you indicated two nine-foot lanes. But um, truly, the street itself, I don't think, is is necessarily going to be a high-volume street. It's going to act more like a a lower or a minor local street because um, there's really no through traffic. Uh, there's a little bit up on the north end in accessing the park. Um, but um, throughout this entire development, we essentially have two public streets. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the remainder of the network um, is, a, is privately owned and maintained. Um, and so, you know, I think... Um, our thought of our, our thoughts of well, 
with with the narrow, I know you had brought you brought up the narrow narrower tariffs with, um, and you know certainly, you know we can provide some. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, one of your other cross sections allows for a for a four and a half foot terrace width if there's a bike path on there. I think it was a seventy foot wide one, um, and as long as the conditions of, there's the soils it's con, the soils are conditioned for the trees or if you select trees that are tolerable or that can sustain that narrow width, um, you know, that's certainly something we'd be, be able to do. Um, yeah, and I'll tell you, I mean, most of what we run into with terraces that are that narrow are tree health. They just stay stunted. They don't want to grow into the limestone that we put under the sidewalks or under the roads. Mm -hmm. And that's one issue. But the one that really rings my phone is uh, every time we plow a street, we're pushing snow onto someone's sidewalk. Mm -hmm. almost always after they finish clearing it. So, um, you know, nobody really likes to shovel snow, but they really don't want to shovel snow twice. And when they do, they throw it back in the street and then you plow it back up on the sidewalk and they shovel it a third time. It, it does happen. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to avoid that by having wider terraces that function for tree health and separation of pedestrians and vehicles, but also um, some snow storage areas. So we have a fighting chance not to plow onto the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sean, I would say that's extremely important. I know I get lots of complaints from residents on Century about the city plowing snow onto the sidewalks. We're not even Cut. plowing Century, so don't take I those know. calls. And then I have to explain <laughs> that it's the county that's doing it. Yeah. But um, they are not happy. I mean, it's a constant complaint in the winter. Yeah. And and I know part of the design goal here is to make people happy. So I it's yeah. a caution I throw out there. You know, and that and that kind of, you know, it then that kind of goes to, well, maybe we do we want to. Um, consider just the 50 foot right away with the typical 20 foot street section. Um, like I said, there's, there's, or do we transition from, because the, if you, once you're at the intersection of Bellefontaine and Serenby, um, whether you go, you know, the, the, the homes that are being act, the homes on the north side, east of Serenby, you know, there's that little stretch that there'll be, you, that little stretch of Serenby from Bellefontaine, that first 150 feet or so, 100 to 150 feet to, to that first blue drive right there. Yeah. From the intersection of Bellefontaine and Serenby. You yeah. know, yeah, that, that section of Serenby right there, you know, those homes that are at, that are that are living on that uh, blue private drive. You know they're going to be turning on. They're going to be accessing it on that short stretch of Serenbean more than likely. So do we consider maybe a just a wider section there, and then you know the 28 foot section there, and then skinning it down to 50 feet? I'm sorry, to, to the 20 feet, the standard, um, or some combination, um, and going south as well. I think the the south seems to be more of a to me, a, a low volume local road, local street. When you have those commercial things up on the corner there, though, that's going to draw some traffic. Commercial ground level cafe, whatever. That certainly is going to right. bring bring some traffic into the area. That's not necessarily uh, traffic from the residences around there. I assume you're going to want other uh, customers coming in there, and that's going to mean more traffic. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. these uses have off-street parking? Yes. They do. Okay. Yeah, they'll they'll be either underground or or um or there'll probably be some uh, on street parking that we'll have on Bellefontaine. Um and, and again if we if um you know if, if we can utilize Serenby for some of the parking as well. And that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And right now, I, I mean, I feel like I'm throwing stuff out there and just guessing. I wonder if the TIA 
using land uses proposed at densities proposed could offer some traffic volumes for these proposed streets that might help make informed decisions. Yeah. I would also just add, we does, you know, Sarin B Street was designed to be a quiet street. Um, and that's why, you know, the parking for all the housing is accessed behind it. The multifamily really doesn't, the multifamily on that Southern section does not have to, um, you know, uh, come down Sarin B Street. I, it's designed to be just this like quiet, lovely, Com but compact so everybody can like bump into each other in terms of walking and stuff kind of street. And so I don't see it as this major, we didn't design it to be a major like thoroughfare in terms of traffic. It's why all that consideration went into where, how will people, you know, where will they park behind their houses and all of that. Mm -hmm. Jason, do you have anything you want to add? I was just thinking about that. Um, hi, I'm Jason Claypool with Steinberg Hart, and uh, we're, we've been focusing on the multifamily component, which is everything to the west of Saren, to Saren B. And to build off of what Kathleen was talking about, the, the design of Saren B, we've always been interested in keeping all of the multifamily traffic off of Saren B. So, one of those connections that you can see there highlighted is bringing the multifamily cars in and out uh, and off of Parmenter. And really the only, and actually no through connection to the east. If you do drive in, no through connection to Saren B, you're only connecting um, the rear of the shotgun homes to their garages. The, that driveway coming in, when if I were, for instance, if I were driving northbound on Parmenter and I live in one of these multifamily buildings, I would turn right and then I would immediately turn left or right into a parking garage of the multifamily. What you're actually seeing for, yeah, correct, in that area. What you're actually seeing that's continuing to the east and the connections um, also serves a purpose to uh, access the shotgun homes, as I mentioned but also for fire department to get through and around the multifamily buildings and serve those as well. But with all of those bends and those turns and, and the narrowness of these private drives, we're discouraging multifamily um, tenants from driving to and from Serenb and also the public as well to, to cut through there. Yeah, and, and it's possible Serenb doesn't need any parking. Any what? Any parking. Mm, on no, parking. I, I think. I think it does. I, well, I, I think it does guessed. too, but it's possible I'm wrong. If they have guessed, uh, Sean and Don can probably speak to this. The people that live down on the street where your old house was, Don. Oh. The Guard Park neighborhood? No, for your old house, that oh, street, oh, where there, there is, is no parking. Yeah, there is no parking there, correct. But people park there anyway. Oh, well, um, if you had yes, where do they park? They should park in the slip, which holds four cars, five cars maybe. And then they walk two houses or two lots up. Um, my, can, I had my hand raised and I'm really concerned about this whole commercial development that's taking place at Bellefontaine and Serenby. I, I see little or no off-street parking in there that's available for people that want to go to the cafe or grocery store, unless that's about the size of a bodega. There's going to be people driving there and wanting someplace to park. Uh, I'm not sure what a tower is. Um, okay. I can jump in and answer some of that. So there will well, be. Let me, let me finish first so you can yep. answer everything. There's a commercial ground level and multifamily next to that. Uh, there's talk about alleys, but I really see very little off street parking. So when Susan says you're going to need on street parking, you may need significant on street parking or these commercial establishments and 
Some of them might be offices, a real estate office or whatever, which we have here in Middleton Hills, but they need parking. And mm -hmm. if they don't have it, they're not gonna have customers and they're not gonna survive. So I'm just curious, how, how are you dealing with that commercial area and parking, not just Bellefontaine and Serendipity? Um, so both the grocer and the cafe will have underground parking. Also, there is podium parking under the multifamily. So where the, um, there's commercial on the first floor of the multifamily, they will uh, park underground as well. And we're trying to create, I mean, we've been, very, we've been very disciplined about holding back on the amount of commercial. We're trying to build commercial that creates a community of walkable pedestrian community. And so when you say I, that grocer will be like, a, it, it, I, it won't be a bodega, but it might, be, it might be a little bigger than that, but we're not looking to build a major grocer. We're looking to create, to, to build commercial that actually serves the community that the community can walk to. So we're really, you know, in, in our minds, the community itself will be walking to these things. There will be underground parking for both the grocer and the cafe. And then, like I said, there's large podium underground parking for the multifamily sites that will you know, also serve the uh, serve the uh, the first floor commercial of the of the uh, multifamily, which is really just a, a tapas bar. We this is not. I really want to make sure everybody's clear that we are not building a ton of mixed use with a ton of first floor retail everywhere. That is not the intention of this. We see too much of that going on, where then a check's cashed store goes into a place like that because they can't rent them out. We wanted to hold back and really think about what do people want and need. We want to create a place where people don't have to get in their car and drive everywhere. And so to us, that is the primary focus. And then for those people who will be coming from offsite, we do have parking in terms of the underground parking and some select street parking as well. Um, that's great. In concept, except you have huge uh, multi-family developments across Parmenter. And this is a quick grab for them because otherwise they have to go downtown or they have to come here to Middleton Hills or someplace else. And again, without people, commercial is just going to die. I mean, we're having a hard time maintaining commercial here in this neighborhood. Underground parking, uh, Sean, maybe you can address this. T-Wall has always said, oh, you can always park under our apartment buildings in downtown Middleton. They don't. Um, yeah, um, they don't. Yeah, that's, that's just it. They don't. In fact, they have a hard time going to the parking lot just to the uh, east of most of the uh, commercial buildings in downtown Middleton. Um, so I guess I, I'm... I'm a little concerned about parking and, and traffic and where there is and isn't going to be parking available just because of the mixed use that is taking place in the surrounding community, not just this one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the downtown underground parking though is a lack of signage. So I think like if they had signage here directing people to underground parking, I wouldn't be as concerned about that. The, the downtown parking, I think, doesn't have clear signage. That is true. Well, we have a couple of questions that we were asked to uh, resolve tonight. We're obviously not going to uh, resolve the big one re regarding Bellefontaine. I personally am not very comfortable with the Serenby Street plan. I, I don't think that street is wide enough. I don't think the terraces are wide enough. We don't have any bike paths on any of these, which is kind of uh, part of the city's overall plan these days, too, is to have bike path options in places. Um, we actually do have, uh, I don't know if you can share, or I don't know if Bruce can share it. We've been working very closely with the, on the bike path with Mark Opitz. So we have a 10-foot bike path off road that goes all the way along Bellefontaine. And that's just getting finalized. So we've been working on that. It's just not in front of you at the moment. 
goes the entire length of Bellefontaine from Parmenter all the way to Misty Valley. And then that southern path of Misty Valley that comes in a little bit south of our property, there will be an off road connection to the main path. So um, I don't know, Bruce, if you're yeah. able to. Well, I can either do that or Sean, if, if you were see where the 66 foot right there. So yeah. right there is where the, right at the end, of, right at that leader there is where the existing bike path ends. And so we would go west uh, from that yeah. point. I'm sorry, no, no, the, the, the letter or the number 66. Oh, right okay. There. So can you show the concept? No. I think that would be helpful. Uh, why don't I? Why not don't this thing that says not this thing that well, says bike path? Bruce will share his screen, yeah. and this will be easier. Way, is there a way for me to allow? Oh. I think so. I think you okay, can. Here we go. Uh, post disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm. I think I'll well, get. Um, Sean, are you the one running the, uh, if you go to advanced options under screen share, I, I ran into this this morning. So if you look at screen share, there should be a little arrow and then you'll see advanced options. So let's try that now, Bruce. Okay, here we go. That helped. All right. You see the, uh, the technical drawing. The drawing with the uh, with the uh, fuchsia. Yeah. Here's the connection point of the current path. We would be bringing it up, crossing this private drive, and running it alongside up to up to Bellefontaine, and then have a, its own dedicated bike path separate from the roadway uh, that runs parallel to it, uh, eventually connecting to Parmenter. So this is the primary bicycle bike route, um, making that connection. Um, you know, there, we do have, and it, it may be, it may have shown up on the concept, but adjacent to that is, the, is a, a boardwalk for internal usage, whether it's foot traffic or, um, well, primarily foot traffic, but, um, but that gets people from the, in, within the neighborhood to this central area the, or, the, or the commercial retail area. Um, Do you have anything with bike lanes or just a bike path? Right now, it's just, we've got this bike path uh, and we've actually initially it was a 66 or right away the way you had it you, what we had shown to you but we've expanded that to 70 to ensure we have a, a, a decent terrace width um, but yeah this is the, the the main bike path through the development and then um, you know the streets within the private roads within can certainly um, you know, people can bike on that, on those. Mm -hmm. But there's there's not a bike path or a bike lane on Serenby Street from the south that would go all the way up across Bellefontaine and up to where the park is going to be, correct? There's no bike well, path. Well, there, there's probably no, there's no dedicated path or lane, but certainly bikes can use it. Well, the, it's... They That's part of the intention of the design too, is to slow down the cars and you narrow the narrow the street, push all the through traffic to other streets, slow it down and be like a shared street for for bicycles. But in addition, Parmenter in the future, I believe, is going to have bike lanes. So if someone's commuting northbound, they can go on Parmenter. If they want to take a break from the traffic or meander through the, the community under the trees in the shade, they can go on Siren B Street. Or the cars, you know, move a lot slower. Yeah, I, um, this is Carrie. I, I really like the idea of narrowing our streets. Um, I feel like a lot of the streets in Middleton are really overly wide in that it causes traffic to speed, like there's really fast cars. Like where I live off of Middleton Street, 
Middleton Street is extremely wide. There's parking on both sides and it's a bus, it's a bus route. Like it's, it's, it serves a lot of purposes, but it's really wide. And as I bike on that street all the time, it's, it, it just, it's like a freeway because cars are driving so fast. So I, I, I do think like if there's narrowing, it causes traffic to slow down. Um, now I don't know like how far, you know, we should go with that with narrowing. Um, but I, in this plan, I think like the street width seems fine. Um, Sean, your comment about the terraces with the trees, you know, if that's an issue, I would, I would, it probably would be good to, if we could make the terraces a little bigger so the trees, you know, we want to make sure the trees grow and are healthy. Um, but I guess I'm not, I'm not really hearing like what's the problem with the street width or what the concerns are. Sure. And this is Robert, I, I tend to agree. I, I, and I know, I think Bruce Maya mentioned to this, that their preference would have been the 50 foot width with parking on one side, then you get you know nine feet of terrace space uh, and five foot uh, sidewalks. Um, I do see Serenby as being a road that could get by with parking on one side. I mean, and then and then you know, you have basically two lanes when there's not parking on the one side. And if there's a lot of parking on one side, you get you really slow down the traffic because you know the the two lanes now have to keep avoid, you know, veering to the one side to avoid parked cars. And that tends to mean that they pass each other very slowly. But Serenby does seem like it's designed to be. Uh, for very infrequent use by cars and, and to try to direct the traffic more onto uh, uh, Bellefontaine, it seems like it's, it's actually fairly well thought out for that purpose. So that would give you the wider terraces, but it does say parking on only one side. And now it's conforming to a version of street that we, I guess, have approved in the past. Yeah, I agree with that, Robert. So I don't know. I mean, I, 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 see, I see what the developer is trying to do here, and I guess I applaud it. I, I, like, like everybody, I mean, there's, there's some unknowns for us, but I, I think there's some real benefits here. Thank you for putting that up. I was, yeah, I mean, right now it looks like they're trying to play this game of trying to get the 60-foot width right away into a 50 foot width to get parking on both sides. And I guess I feel like they're doing that only because they're, they're trying to serve a lot of masters at once. And their preference is to go more to that 50 foot width just shown above on this with parking on only one side. And I think that's reasonable, um, but it probably needs to be marked parking on only one side. Yeah, I mean, you know, no parking on this side of the street ever. And then the only caveat there is what does that do for winter parking? Does that just basically mean that nobody can park there every other night? Well, we have an ordinance that exempts one-sided parking streets from alternate side parking, mm -hmm. which makes snow removal that much more fun. Because uh, <laughs> then people just don't ever have to move their car. Sure. Which effectively means that side of the street doesn't get flooded. Got it. Correct. And that's, that is something that needs to be considered, but um, so maybe, maybe parking on both sides is still desirable, but I, I, I tend to agree that the, the terraces need to be wider also for snow removal, as well as tree health. And you get that with the 50 foot width shown in this view, but I also understand that it sounds like we're giving up something. We have a shared traffic lane for one thing. Well, not really. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's because I mean, in my on my street, Moss Parkway, do people park on the street? Yes, including me. But most of the time, um, 
there's a way that I can wend. And yes, my, my driving has to curve a little, right? I have to, I, I, I drive kind of along the gutter when I can, or, you know, near the side of the street. And then I have to go out more toward the center line of the street um, when there's a car parked on the side of the street that I'm driving on. And then sometimes there's cars coming at me then, and then they'll both slow down and we still get past each other. How it wide is Voss Parkway, Robert? Sorry? How wide is Voss Parkway? It's wider. quite a bit wider, but it's also parking on both sides. Yeah. What I'm saying is if you do restrict the parking on only one side, you, you get the same effect, but with a narrower street. Well, you have a narrow street, that's for sure. Sure. But it's one that apparently we've said is, well, I, I shouldn't say it. It says typical street sections, not to scale. I'm assuming that this is something that Middleton has said is okay in the past. We, we have one of these, yeah. So, I mean, so we've said it's acceptable. The question is, what do you give up for this? And it sounds like the one thing is snow plowing in the winter gets, as Sean said, more fun. But it would allow for when the snowplow does come through, it gives you that terrace width that you need. It gives the trees the room that they need to thrive. It gives you the, the sidewalks on both sides. It just says, yeah, if, if there's parking, it's only allowed on one side and the cars have to avoid the parked, the moving cars have to avoid the parked cars. And I, I get that you, now probably don't get a very good snow plowing in that park side, the park, the, sorry, the parked car side. Yeah, well, and part of what I don't know is I mean, these, these cross sections were set up to be um, applicable to certain situations. I have no idea if Serenby does or doesn't meet that yet. I, I, only just recently seen this drawing that I forwarded to you. Sure. Um, you know, so for me, part of what I don't know is does the proposed road support the expected need? Right. And it's always a chicken or egg type situation in that um, if you build a restrictive enough street, it gets less use. So it does take a leap of faith a little bit from everybody's standpoint, including the developers of will this work or not? Uh, there are some unknowns here, but I think there's unknowns no matter what you do. I'm willing to embrace some of these unknowns. I agree, Robert. And I used to live in the city of Seattle that had very narrow streets and granted there wasn't snow plowing. Well, there was snow sometimes, but it worked. It worked, right? Like I, I think that it can, it will work. I don't think it's that concerning. I, I do think we have to move away from wider streets. I think it's, you know, just in terms of stormwater, right? Like why create, like why create something that's not needed? I guess is what the question I have. Like, well, if it's not needed a wider road in this location, I don't think we should design it, over design. And, and I don't think you can do it everywhere, but I think Serenby is, is one of the places where it could be pulled off. But I'm willing to hear from other viewpoints. <laughs> I would say the terraces need to be bigger for catching snow and in a neighborhood where it's the density is so high, trees that grow well are really appreciated. And that's been one big disappointment in the retail area of Middleton Hills. We've got trees there that are truly struggling because they're planted in these little squares with concrete surrounding them. And so really consider the trees because that's going to be an important addition to the neighborhood. I agree. 
Um, yeah, I do too. I think nine or nine or ten feet though is is pretty traditional. I would like ten feet for the terraces more than nine. Well, mm. these are not, these are not ten. Well, on Serenby, it was shown as much smaller, like five feet. I thought they were that's, that's if they have parking on both sides. No, from the curb to the sidewalk would be four and a half. With parking okay. on one side. Regardless of parking, from the curb to the sidewalk, the grass would be four and a half. And that's thought, not big enough. I thought we were talking a 50 foot width right of way, and they could change the configuration to what's shown on the screen at the top of your screen right now. Oh, that would be a different, this would be one of our city standards without, right. without the extra pavement width. The, the proposal in the um, current concept drawing is for a 28 foot wide street from face of curb to face of curb right. in a 50 foot right of way. So it's right. basically taking this and adding eight feet of pavement. Right. Uh, okay. So maybe I got to send it back to Bruce and... Um, Others, the developers. Uh, Kathleen, are. Yeah, I'll, I mean, Bruce, I'll have Bruce jump in, but I think Bruce would be very comfortable with that top drawing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm totally fine with that top drawing with the, with the 20 foot wide street width, the wider terraces, um, designated parking on one side. Um, yeah, we'd be totally fine with that. In that top drawing, Sean, how, what's the terrace width on both sides? Nine on this feet. top drawing, it's eight and a half feet of grass on both sides. Eight and a half feet of terrace. Yes, that which is pretty normal for a typical city street that you see around town. And that would provide certainly more room for snow storage and maybe a better opportunity for trees to survive. Right, yeah. And with that smaller street width, you just have that less, that much less snow too to plow that would build up, right? Yes, just something to consider. Yes. In fact, on the one that we have like that, we can't get a regular snow plow down the street. It has to wait until we can get our loader uh, to go clear it. Well, that's maybe a concern too. If you can't get a regular plow down that street at that width. Well, our, our loader will clear it. I just, I don't, I can't say when it'll get there. Yeah. We only have one of those. That's something for the neighborhood uh, developers to consider, I guess. That's a trade-off you want to make. Assuming, assume, <laughs> assuming cars are parked on one side and, and pretty regularly, what size street do you need to get a, a normal snow plow through out, out of curiosity? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I just, I I, we only have a, a few different kinds of standards. I mean, when you get to the next jump up, you've got, you know, 20 feet from the curb to the car. Sure. Um, where it okay. where it doesn't fit is twelve. Yeah. No, and then I get it. I guess I just I was asking just because if if we've said that this upper drawing is one that we have used in the city, it's it's one that we quote unquote approve, and then say oh but yeah but you can't actually actually ever drive a snowplow through it. It's like it would, if knowing that it would only take four more feet would get you what you need. For it's a future discussion, but mm. um, to say you know if if fifty doesn't quite work for right away and get a snowplow through, but 53, 54 does, maybe we should look at that in the future. But for tonight, it sounds like the developer showed us what they showed us, but they're more than willing to look at this upper low volume street configuration. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, would welcome it. All right.
<laughs> well, do we have to um, wrap up a couple of these other points as well, Sean, that were raised? Um, well, so that was that was one of the questions. Um, you know, is um, you know what what's the preference on Serenby? Um, as a typical cross-section would go. And I don't feel like I can advise the committee on what to do with that until I have a better sense for how the land use is proposed and what the practical needs for on-street parking, um, whether or not there's a need for bike lanes, whether or not you know we, we want wider terraces for tree health. The other, I mean, the other way to do it is to just pick one and go with it. Um, I just, I don't feel like I can advise you on that. Well, we I'm seem saying. to have some consensus on the wider terraces for tree health and snow storage. Um, I don't know about the bike lane uh, question. I don't know if people have preferences as to wanting bike lanes or not, not room to put any bike lanes anywhere in there. Um, and then we had the other, I don't know if you want a motion on that or if you just want to hold on that until we get more information about um, how all of this is going to unfold. Yeah, for me, it's difficult to make these kinds of decisions one little piece at a time. I, right. Yeah. If you want to give some sort of guidance, I think, to the designer, that would be great. Um, well, I think we've done that with respect to the street width and the terrace widths, have we not, designers? Yes, thank you. Yep. Yes. And what I would say for the bike lanes is, um, I mean, this is just guidance, this isn't a motion, but kind of contingent upon their continued work with the bike ped committee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd like, I know it affects what we're talking about with right of way and, and road widths and everything. Um, it sounds to me like they have a plan for how bikes can get there either on street, on sidewalk, or taking other paths. Because um, they have a really nice bike path that runs alongside and parallel to um, Bellefontaine. But you know, here there's I don't I don't see a huge need for a bike path here, just like in on my in my past my house, I don't have a bike path. I have a sidewalk and I can either take to the street or I can not so appropriately ride my bike on the sidewalk if I feel uncomfortable being on the street, but I don't have a, I don't have a bike path there. And I think it's not necessary to have a bike path on every street. I think where they do have a good bike path is where it needs to be. And on Serenby, I'm not convinced that a bike lane is or bike path is necessary, but I would, you know, I would, let uh, our friends and bike ped make the final determination of what they need and what they want and then we'll have to look at it again if they say we really need a bike lane here um, or a bike path or something uh, we have to figure out how to fit it all in and that may change our recommendation at that time okay i would echo um, robert's comments comments on the bike lane um I was going to say the same thing. We should, you know, kind of defer to bike ped. And also, um, I think that the bike path is really great that there's like, bike that they're connecting the bike path and then connecting that to Parmenter. I really like, that was great to see. So maybe mm -hmm. some way connecting to the bike path would be something to think about. Um, Bob, Mark Opitz has his hand up. I just noticed. I'm sorry, Mark. I, I have not got that feature on my computer, so. Oh, no worries. Their hand up, somebody has got to cue me in. On, yeah. so. And I'm sorry you can't see me. I'm out in the dark right now. I'm out, out in my yard. Um, what I was going to say about the bike path is that we, not only does it connect to Parmenter, but as you probably all know, there's the Highway 12 path runs along right. Highway 12. And so it will intersect with that at Parmenter and Schneider. And then going east through the development, the path will actually fork. It will go southeast to Graber Pond and from there east through Misty Valley to um, Whittlesey Road at the Conservancy at Whittlesey and, and uh, Whittlesey and um, Pheasant Branch Road. So that will be one 
route that people can take. And then the other route will be to continue along Bellefontaine all the way east to uh, Pheasant Br uh, to uh, Bishop's Bay is the, is the, is the uh, city's uh, vision for, for the path going all the way to Bishop's Bay, through Bishop's Bay to Governor Nelson State Park. So that's why this path connection through Bell Farm is so important and why I believe the developer completely understands the importance of that path and it's really going to be a key component of the development. So I just wanted to tell you that from a context standpoint, that's what we're, that's where we're, we're heading. Good, thank you. Great. Yeah. And, and, and Mark, while you're still on the line, yep, uh, sure. maybe, um, has there been any talk about some overarching need to have bike lanes on Serenby, the north south? No, I wouldn't see no. a need for that. We haven't talked about that level of detail and I wouldn't see a need for that. We, we generally do uh, bike lanes on our arterial and collector streets. If this is, I heard some discussion about this possibly being a collector street, but I'm not sure I understand that. I want to understand that better with Sean, but um, I wouldn't foresee that we would have bike lanes on Parmenter to the west and possibly Bellefontaine going east, but the focus is the path. Um, it's becoming clearer and clearer with distracted driving and, and what people prefer is that bike paths, uh, a, connect a network of bike paths, it makes, more people comfortable. Um, if the if if Bellefontaine were a multi-lane facility, then having bike lanes would be appropriate as well. Um, even if it's not a multi-lane facility, that's something we should still keep on the table, as far as I'm concerned. And that's why that width is is important to keep um, on the table so that we have that flexibility. Okay, thank you. So it seems to me that the east-west path is already been pretty well reviewed by bike ped and that's it. they're happy with it and well well the committee hasn't officially just oh, to be sorry. clear it hasn't so i mean and that's something that will happen i mean this is what 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 kathleen and her team are doing is, is coming to you with early concepts and obviously there's a lot of work to be done sure. um but the road bellefontaine the future of bellefontaine is, is obviously a key component of this so that's why she wanted to get your input great all right thank you I think um, I would be comfortable with the 50 foot standard right away uh, as Sean showed in his diagram. And I don't think there's a need for a bike path on a, on a street that's not going to be heavily traveled. It's, so like, yeah. it's like a lot of residential streets in the city uh, that don't have identified bike paths. So we think Serenby is good and we think what the plan, the proposed plan as as draft as this is, you know, the, the proposed plan for bike paths alongside or, or off of Bellefontaine are also looking good. So that's, I think that's very positive. Okay, so the other two questions, uh, policy level questions were about, um, I think the, the number of intersections proposed on Parmenter Street, which are, of course, Bellefontaine across from Schneider, um, Serenby Street up on the north, this um, commercial drive lane slash fire lane uh, access um, that's shown in sort of a tan color. Uh, and then furthest south, I want to say is uh, this is a private drive of some sort. Yes. And, and is this a shared access then with the neighboring property? It is. There's currently a shared access easement that straddles um, along the north side of that CSM to the south. Okay. So we'll upgrade that drive, that existing drive there to, you know, to, to, to our cross section and, and, connect the drives accordingly. Oh, will, will people know that this is private? Would it just have a sign? Would there be some physical feature suggesting that? Um, Other, well, we, could, we would have probably a, a street sign that we could uh, put up that calls it private. Um, hmm. Okay, I, and we commonly do that, I mean, Frankly, it looks exactly like a public street sign, and then it just has the word private, mm -hmm. which is fine. And it doesn't keep the public out. No, no there should not be that expectation. 
I mean, if, if we're not going to do something really special, like a driveway type entrance instead of a street type entrance, I would expect the general public will use it. The same uh, holds true for the one a little farther north, the one in Tan. Direct that uh, right in, right out. Um, oh, here? Right there. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's going to be used as an avenue to get into the area as well, I think, is it that? It yes. might. It, it's right in, right out, like you mentioned. Yeah. And like one of the other, I think it was one of the uh, architects had mentioned that it's internally circuitous. So yeah. you have to, you have to sort of want to use it to make all these turns. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but if your goal is, you know, I, I just want to get here. I, I don't know if it's a horse apiece for you to go up this way or down this way or up here, um, how you get there if you just want to go north. I, I suspect some people are just going to want to hop across the street and come out here because it's... Yeah, I mean, no matter what you call them, they're going to be used to get in and out of the yeah. department and to go to the cafe or the whatever. Sure. Well, yep. I thought Sean made a good point, though. Is, is there any reason why you wouldn't, you couldn't put a, basically a driveway apron at the bottom that makes it a little bit more visually like oh geez I have to this isn't just a at grade road going from one road to another but I actually have to drive my car up of a little bit of a concrete incline to get to something that looks a little bit more like a driveway for both of those two southern actually Robert they need to look like the alleys in Middleton Hills is that a good do path? have a, which Sorry, do have a driveway apron so yeah I mean like I when I drive through Middleton Hills um, I don't accidentally you know, take the, the alleyways. Yeah, because I consider those actually alley or what I would consider an alleyway. And so if they are built with the driveway apron going up, you don't have very many people using them other but, than people whose yeah. property backs up to them. So, I mean, just, just some things other than just putting a sign up that says private drive. It sounds like there might be some other visual cues that might Well, for Serenby off of Parmenter, it's going to need a private drive because that's a little bit bigger. And we do have an alley in Middleton Hills between Guard Park and the condos behind the shopping center. And that's used for cut through all the time, even though it is a private drive. Okay. And there's lots of complaints by the owners of that private drive that it's used publicly. Well, that's good information. Thank you, Susan. Then um, having that discussion, I noticed Sean's now put a cul-de-sac on the south end of uh, Serenby so that people can turn around. Right now it's a dead end street then essentially and no way to turn around other than go through that private drive out to Parliament. Yeah, we're not too thrilled with the cul-de-sac down there just that it for from our purposes it it just feels too um suburban with a cul-de-sac so if i mean if we don't have any issues with people transitioning from a public street to a private drive um because we're going to be maintaining that and i don't know if it's um i don't know if if a or a modified turnaround down there but I think our, our preference would be how it's shown. It would just be transitioned to a private drive. Um, your maintenance requirements would, would end right before the corner. And um, then we would pick it up from there. So that would entail obviously added maintenance costs to all of the residents in the neighborhood for that one section of drive. It would, but we, we have to make that connection anyway, and we can't, it can't be a public street unless we can, unless we, unless we approach the owners to the south and, and get them to dedicate some, some land. So we were aware of that being, having to be a private street all along. So I think that kind of comes with the territory. And, and if a delivery vehicle is going down that way, there's no objection to that? No. Okay. And when we pick up our plow blade, what do we do with that? 
<laughs> Good point, Sean. <laughs> well, um, is there how, how do you how, how do you typically treat the uh, intersections like the like up at the if we were to up at the north end where you tee into the parmenter? Mm -hmm. Is that just generally off to the? Yeah, they would tend to just follow that curve and make a right-hand turn to try to push as much of that snow off to the edge as they can, and then wrap it around and keep huh. going. Now, if we're going to go to that, if we're going to go to that fifty-foot cross section, though, with a twenty-foot street, that's going to require the loader. It almost felt like you were mentioning earlier. So maybe by that, by doing that, we can we have a bit easier chance of dumping it off to the side. Yeah, we've got that opening on the side there. I mean, we we obviously want to be planting lots and lots of trees, but there is that. I mean, the, the stormwater management ponds don't come up that far. Um, so there is room off to the, yeah, right yeah, in that section. That area. Yeah, that might be something to think about. I, I can't remember if our loader at this point is putting on a blade or using their bucket, but I think they go out with a blade. Um, well, yeah. well, that's I can't even say that. Don't have to work out tonight. Is, yeah, no, yeah. it just gets to a level of confusion. We don't have a lot of dead end streets that don't actually dead end. Is that also going to be right in, right out the blue section of the, the private same. drive? Yeah, this yes. should be a full intersection because across the street is Springton Court. So we're not right now proposing a median across that intersection. John, do you mind if I talk a little bit about that, the circulation and clarify in okay. the multifamily? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted, so when we look at Sarah and B Street being a very narrow and slow, there is that intention to use the, the Spring Gen Court extension that we're talking about through the private lane. And we, we actually want the, uh, the people who live in those shotgun units on the west side of Serenby to use this access point from Springton and actually then drive north along the alley to get into their garages. Now, mm -hmm. I'm calling it an alley. It is a private road, but it's going to be incredibly narrow, as narrow as the fire department is going to let us do that. And the reason why is preventing the cut through traffic uh, it's only for service. It's only for the cars getting to the to the garages for the fire department, and then also for pedestrians and bikes of the multifamily. They can walk their dog. It's more of a walkable, narrow street that puts pedestrians and bikes first and foremost. And so, where your hand is there, and that connection, uh, that's more of a convenient connection for cars so that they don't drive 800, 900 feet to get to their garage for the shotguns. And they're offset uh, from that dashed right in, right out tan area that you're showing uh, where we access the multifamily. So you create multiple bends to discourage the cars from cutting through very tight radii, multiple turns and so naturally if someone lives on Saren B Street or even if they live to the east in these other single family homes there will be no desire to drive through those tan areas in those alleys they'll want to go north on Saren B Street up to Bella Fontaine or go south down Saren B uh, to the Springton Court extension really what we're doing there just to kind of bring it all home is that fire department's going to need access through the multifamily. We're going to restrict that access as much as possible to cars. We don't want to invite them to go through. And by having that right in, right out on Parmenter um, asks or encourages the multifamily residents to use that access point and reduce the traffic on Serenby. So hopefully that, that kind of explains a little bit of what our concept is. Uh, for, for this entire area here. Yeah, so at this concept level, not knowing a lot more, I don't have any particular objection to saying I could expect a development of this size to have multiple 
connections to Parmenter Street. Mm -hmm. That seems fair. And until we have the TIA, I, I might not know whether this is a good idea, bad idea, or completely indifferent. Um, but I would expect mm -hmm. there to be multiple access points. Sean, I have a question about an access point. If you go further to the top, there's a little area that looks like a street coming off of Parmenter Street between Parmenter and Serendy that's not in color. This what is mm -hmm. this? Yes, well, that. That was a hand-drawn sketch initially. Um, that was replaced with the longer sweeping curve because of the um, center line requirements for a local street. Okay, Middle so it rate. doesn't exist. So that's no. old, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There would I, be no I kind of thought, well, we just won't allow it, but it sounds like you won't either. So that's good. Good, good question, Susan. Okay. But I, we, I did talk to, Bruce and I have been talking about the plan. I think there was something that we wanted to, I don't know if this is the correct forum, but we were talking about the possibility for a tighter, yeah, tighter so radius turn. Out at uh, Middleton Hills, uh, there's a there's a there's a actually a, a corner se section out at Ramsey and um, on the east end of I can't remember the name of the street now. Ramsey yeah. and John Muir. Yeah, that's it. So there's like a 90 degree turn, um, and 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 initially when I when I I hadn't realized that when I drew in this sweeping curve and I'm, and then when I when I uh, took a closer look at the at the, the, the Middleton Hills plat I noticed there was that 90 degree corner and I'm just wondering if that um, if there's an opportunity to do that here um, that would help um, preserve a little additional park parkland instead of having to go cut through here. I would agree with that. I think it would be more important to preserve the parkland as one piece instead of having, you know, a road through the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of it's not hard to make that turn and it slows traffic down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we were okay, talking well, about. That's good to know because I, 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 if, if that option's on the table, then I think we'll revisit this and and, um, and maybe maybe work that in. Okay. And then I think the last uh, policy question uh, was about whether the committee would support public utilities within easements in private streets. And, and we have that elsewhere where we've got utilities and easements. So I don't have any particular reason to recommend an objection to that. Anybody else have any reason to object to that committee? Nope. I don't. No, I think it'd be a good plan actually. Yeah, I think so too. I, I do have a quick question not to slow down the evening but um is there any ability for bell fontaine to be a little less curvy in its you know it, 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 it yeah left and right and left and right and left um it slows traffic it does well hopefully And, and the I question think that's is important. how much how, we're still debating that, unfortunately. And I, I know I just wanted to bring it up quickly because we're not really, we're kind of ignoring Bell Fontaine right now. Yeah. But I mean, you're planning townhomes, you know, south and north of this and other, other facilities. And is that curviness, um, if, 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 if we get more information and, and we say, well, this still needs to be, have a certain amount of throughput on Bellefontaine and maybe we can get by with 
not turning this into four lanes, but um, or two lanes each way, but, but we still don't want to slow them tra down traffic quite that much. How much, uh, how much is that wavy path? Robert, can I interrupt? You may. I see this equivalent to Frank Lloyd Wright that goes around the detention ponds in Middleton Hills. By having it as that big curve, it definitely slows it down and makes it safer. I, and, I agree. I agree. The question, and I think though, that's really important because yeah, this is a high density is, area. You don't want people speeding through there. If it's straighter, they'll go faster. We don't want people speeding, but we also are still debating whether this needs to be a somewhat of a collector. And if we find out this needs to be somewhat of a collector, we can't slow it down that much. That's like saying, oh, I, hey, let's, okay. let's make, I don't let's make see it highway, a let's, make, let's make the belt line, you know, one lane each way and put a whole bunch of parked cars along one side you can do that, but it's no longer the belt line. I don't see this as a collector unless it's because we're no longer developing that acre development. So that well, was a major development. It's still an open question. I'm 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 yeah. I'm kind of with you, Susan, in that you know I I hope that the data backs that up that it's not as necessary but it's not quite defined yet. So I just wanted to, while we're waiting for more data and that's what we're kind of waiting for the MPO yeah. to kind of come back with their data. Well, and as traffic volume increases on Bellefontaine, all of those curves um, mess up sight lines when you're getting in and out of driveways, whether it's to the townhomes. There are no driveways. There are no driveways. Yeah. Driveways? Right, none, yeah. Okay, they're all off the alleys? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So that's so why it, it's like Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, and I, and I hope I hope you're right, Susan. You know, I think, but I'm still with Sean on that point, which is like we're still waiting for some information to come in, which is why we're kind of punting on on what happens on Bell Fontaine. I just wanted to ask the question now: yeah. is you know if they set this in stone too much, uh, you know, and then we do have to come back and make some tweaks, you know, that's where I would see some tweaks maybe happening is the, the road might need to go a little bit more yeah. in line. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking about the development. So this road connects Permanor and High Road. Between that is a fully functioning farm. It's going to be a long time before that gets developed into housing. Just south of that farm is an area which I was always told was a pig farm but is mainly wetlands and so I'm just not seeing a whole lot of development going between here and Pheasant Branch Road in well, the future. I, I, that, I resume... And there's a road further north that could be developed going from queue all the way over to Parmenter, further north. I received my we, call take. I received we have my this question. esoteric discussion when we know more information? That's, and yes. that's why. I, I, I know we're waiting for information. I just brought it up to get people thinking about that that's still an open question right now. We hope that the data will back up the fact that this does not have to be a collector here, but we don't quite know what data will come back from MPO. And until we get that, we probably should reserve any further discussion on it because I think we've answered the points that we wanted to answer this evening. Right. Okay. Do you do you need to wrap all of this up in a motion, or have we just done this kind of by consensus and some advice to the developers? I think the latter would be easier and the good news is there's a recording so <laughs> what but I took a few notes here and there and um, if anybody wants to go to the videotape for uh, advice that the committee has provided I think that'll be easy too okay all right I move we adjourn <laughs>
All right, we have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second to the motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, all.